Good morning, dear colleagues. Welcome to this webinar. Uh, we'll wait a couple of seconds uh, to uh, let our other colleagues join uh, the webinar. I see that uh, today almost 500 people enrolled for this webinar. So uh, we're looking forward to join some experiences on quality assurance of micro credentials with you. Here in Brussels, we can still see many people entering uh, the room. Um, uh, but in a few minutes or a few seconds, we will start our webinar, which will take uh, three hours because there's a lot uh, to say about micro credentials. And even then, uh, today, uh, the discussions will not finish as there is still more uh, to say. So, and what we see already in our chats is that many of uh, the people here uh, say hello to each other. And it's very nice also for us to see that um, this webinar uh, demands interest from all around the European higher education uh, area and beyond. So welcome, uh, dear colleagues. We see that the room is getting fuller and fuller, so I think it's time to start uh, by saying good morning to you, uh, dear colleague, and welcome to this webinar on quality assurance of micro credentials. My name is Patrick van den Bos. I'm ANCA board member and also the head of Vleur QA, a quality assurance agency based in Brussels. You have to know that micro credentials are not at all a new phenomenon, but nevertheless, as we see, um, there are yeah, this is one of the most hot topics in the European higher education area. And the fact that we are here today with so many people is a proof of that. We think, in fact, that the long-standing acknowledgement of the importance of lifelong learning, combined with a more recent emphasis on, on the need for flexible individualized learning paths, that this has resulted somehow uh, in more significant interest in the concepts of, um, of micro-credentials. What, what we often see is on uh, the websites of uh, higher education institutions uh, around Europe is that there is a lot of promotion for micro-credentials. But then when I go to this website, I often wonder, what, what, is, what is a micro-credential? What is the definition? And on many websites, you see different interpretations. Uh, I'm a historian, so before we start, I want to go uh, back in recent history, uh, the European Commission, they wanted to stimulate the European approach to micro-credentials. And it is two years ago in 2020 that we at ENQA provided some input to the European Commission expert group on those micro-credentials. Then based on these discussions, uh, the European Commission has proposed a common European definition for micro-credentials. Uh, they have made common characteristics and also a roadmap of actions um, for this European approach to micro-credentials. Also, more recently, uh, ENQA was involved in a very interesting project. We were a partner of the MicroBall project in which uh, ministries and also stakeholders explored whether and how the existing Bologna tools uh, can be used and yeah, needed to be adapted to be applicable for, to micro-credentials. A micro-credential was defined as a certified small volume of learning. Uh, but for us, as quality assurance agencies, it's also important to reflect on whether and how these volumes of learning and resulting credentials are covered by the processes. And therefore, it was decided that we, within ENQA, uh, we established a working group that was set up, uh, I think it was yeah, one year ago in uh, 21. And this 
working group of ENCA will present its work today. If we are look at today's uh, agenda, we will explore um, existing and also prospective practices for external quality assurance of micro credentials. It's a three hour webinar. So in the second part of this event, we will share with you three cases with both national and regional practices on quality assurance of micro credentials. But in the first part, we will focus more on the work that has been done by this uh, working group. First, it was um, surveyed and was sent to you um, in, uh, in March, I think, of, of uh, this year. And then this working group started to make an analysis and reflect on how the European standards and guidelines are useful uh, or should be differentiated to quality assured uh, micro credentials. The work of this working group um, will lead to a publication this autumn. And I can already reveal that this publication is almost ready. Uh, but the working group explicitly wants to hear the voice of all ENQA members through this webinar. And even then, after this publication, I should say that um, the work around quality issues of micro credentials will not be uh, finished. Therefore, I want to invite you to actively, actively uh, participate in this webinar. You see that there is, uh, you have a chat, and many of us already presented themselves in the chat, but there's also a button for uh, questions and answers. So please, during the webinar, uh, put your questions here in, in the boxes uh, and share your thoughts, your ideas uh, with us and with all the presenters. Before we dive deeper into this topic, uh, I would like to kick off with a message from our ENQA president. Um, I know our president has talked to many of our ENQA members, both online during the during pandemic and uh, in person also over the past three years. And also today he's somewhere abroad, but he's willing to join us. So please, um, Douglas Blackstock, ENQA president, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Patrick. And, uh... Good morning and greetings from Krakow in Poland. Um, uh, uh, Patrick and others know I'm actually on holiday, uh, but but this event is so important that and I'm happy to interrupt it. Uh, it's uh, for those of you, those those I see many names on the the 250 plus attendees who are colleagues that I know from agencies. Some of you who used to be in agencies are now in institutions uh, from right across Europe, but also I see some names of some good friends in the United Arab Emirates and Sri Lanka and other countries. So uh, the, the, this broader audience within all of Europe and outside of Europe, I think is particularly important. But, uh, but I am here for a different type of European event. My commiserations to colleagues from England and Wales for their teams being relegated in the Nations League. And I hope that uh, my colleagues in Northern Republic of Ireland survive relegation and that Scotland get promoted tonight. So that's why I'm here. But I'm in Krakow, but I'm really pleased to be here. This is such a significant, important point in the working group for micro credentials that ENCA established just over a year ago. We recognise that the significant discussions, not only in Europe, but around the world, meant that quality assurance agencies had to think and debate and discuss about how do we respond to the developing world of micro credentials. And my thanks to Anke Greer. Who's a former colleague of mine, but with a different agency now, who's led this group on our behalf, and to Patrick from the board, who, who's been a, a liaison in it, uh, but also the broader group who I've attended uh, certainly one of your meetings and the really, um, if you like, the diligent and energetic way that you've tried to address this topic. So the quality assurance agencies are part of the solution, part of the development, rather than. You can't do this because it's not like it, it, it used to be. Um, I've always been a believer in lifelong learning. And it's too easy in higher education to be sucked into the world of thinking everyone is an 18 or 19 year old school leaver who does a traditional degree. What micro credentials offer um, is a way of using our credit frameworks and qualifications frameworks more, flexible, more flexibly to allow people to develop their education or achievement over a period of time. Uh, dipping in and out if they want to build a qualification over a longer period of time or having a recognised piece of learning that's particularly relevant to the career they're developing or the work they're doing. So I think in that respect, it's really important. 
The other thing is that it does is it democratizes higher education, which is why I was in a meeting last week with the OECD. I was speaking on uh, the quality assurance of cross-border higher education, but in the session before me, they were talking about micro-credentials and more needing to be done. It dominated in large parts of the discussions of the UNESCO World Higher Education Conference in Barcelona back in May, over 2,000 delegates, and the opening up of opportunity through micro-credentials in regions and countries, and also to people who might not be able to afford to take the time out or the expense of doing a full degree at any particular point in the time, and can maybe uh, take a more flexible and different approach. Which is why in my uh, agency in QA, when I was still full time, we started work two or three years ago, CQA colleagues on here as well, on in the UK context, thinking about how we do, uh, how we approach this and how we facilitate it rather than be a barrier. And that's what this group is about. This discussion today, I think, is for us as European agencies and European organisations, it's a significant step forward to be able to support our higher education systems. Um, the one thing that, you know, there's a lot of talk about skills and skills are particularly important, but skills and education can run uh, together. Um, the one thing that shows is the higher level of achievement in education that individuals acquire, the better their life will be, the more route to employment, the more, a better route to well-being and a happier existence. So I, I think this is a really important turning point for us, as I've said before, uh, and I thank everyone for joining. I hope you learn a lot. And, and the one thing from today, Patrick, I would say is this isn't an end point. After these discussions and when the group concludes its work, we need to make sure that we continue a dialogue and promote this so that there is awareness outside of the quality assurance community that the tools we've developed are available and that we're here as part of the, the solution for the longer term. So, so thank you, everyone, and I hope the, the webinar goes really well. Thank you very much, Douglas, for your inspiring words and for joining us uh, today. Um, as said in the introduction, dear colleagues, um, many uh, around the European higher education area are joining us today. But uh, we are wondering who is exactly joining us. Um, you saw already some names popping up uh, with greetings in the chat. But we are going to start a small poll to just know who, who you are and where you're coming from. Are you representative of a ministry? Are you representative of a higher education institution or um, an alternative provider of education? So please um, fill in the poll. Already 50% participated in our poll. That's very good. Thank you for your <laughs> active participation. Okay, most of us participated. So we see that 45% uh, of us are uh, coming from a quality assurance agency, uh, 35 amongst us from a higher education institution. Well, the alternative providers it's only three out of uh, the people uh, present here. And uh, we have 2% representatives from professional associations, business organizations, and also 13% from ministries, government, and policy making organizations, and 4% of others, uh, possibly also some uh, students. So, but we still want to have your active participation because we still have another poll. We also want to know before we start the presentations, what's your, um, what your involvement is with the micro-credentials. Some of us might uh, be active in a design or delivery of micro-credentials. Others have already experience with internal or external quality assurance of micro-credentials or with recognition. And I think also many of us uh, are, are now learning today um, a bit about micro-credentials, hoping that uh, you can start in the near future working on those micro-credentials. We give you a few more seconds to fill in this second poll. Okay, great. So 
This is a very interesting result I can share here with you. 32% uh, um, will in the near future um, work on this topic and 27% will try to get a sense of the topic. So it is still brand new. Let's say one third of people here attending the webinar are already um, familiar with the topic of micro-credentials, but you see, although discussion started and it is a, a really hot topic in higher education, it's still a new and unexplored uh, item. We will try to explore this today a little bit more and thanks to our working group, uh, we can do this today. Um, Today, we will meet her a couple of times as she's a chair of our working group on micro-credentials. So I would like to leave uh, the first presentation uh, on our ENQA project micro-credentials, uh, the quality assurance expectations within the context of the ESG to Anka Greer. Anka, uh, you are the senior advisor of the British Accreditation Council uh, and of course, the chair of our working group, working group. So the floor is yours, Anka. Thank you very much, Patrick. Thank you to everyone joining. Indeed, an impressive attendance. I think, as, as everyone has said, uh, a topic of interest for now, clearly representing the future, either the near future or the longer term future. And uh, we are very, very pleased that you have joined us today. Very pleased to share with you uh, our thinking, our reflections on micro-credentials from the perspective of quality assurance. And of course, as Patrick has said, uh, very interested in your views, very interested to refine our own reflections based on the views that you might want to share with us today. So uh, please use the chat as much as, as possible, use the Q&A. Uh, we will gratefully take on any questions that you have. And if they're not answered today, uh, definitely we will find a way to answer them through the publication that will uh, be forthcoming. So I will share my screen now. Um, a second. Oh, oops, sorry, 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 sorry. Okay. Um, as always, you have everything planned and then, okay, here we go. Is it showing full screen, Patrick? Am I good? Okay, thank you. Um, so today is about the quality assurance of micro-credentials, the expectations within the context of the European standards and guidelines. And you want to know that in March last year, the European Association for Quality Assurance in Higher Education approved a working group to look into the micro-credentials as a phenomenon. Uh, today sums up 18 months of work on the quality assurance of micro-credentials and gives a preview of the working group findings, of course, which then will be followed by the publication that we have mentioned. So the uh, lineup of the day, uh, as Patrick has already alluded to, will be a, an overview of the working group and its activities the survey results uh, that we have in our mapping exercise, the findings of the working group in relation to the European standards and guidelines and more broadly to the micro-credential phenomenon and quality assurance issues associated with it. And not least, uh, the presentation of a few case studies, more to follow in the publication, which we hope will give you some idea about how you can get involved with quality assurance of micro-credentials in the future. And this is especially pertinent for all of you who have indicated that you are looking to understand more about the topic with a view to developing or engaging with this in the future. So um, the ENQA working group uh, I have had the privilege to chair was and is formed, our work is not yet done, uh, by 18 members from 12 countries. Uh, I need to wholeheartedly thank the agencies for allowing colleagues to participate in this voluntarily. 
the commitment that uh, we have seen throughout the 18 months has been absolutely exceptional. Uh, I have had the pleasure to work with colleagues who are um, experts, professional experts in, in everything that they do. They have showed commitment, they have been constructive, they have been collegiate. We have worked indeed as a team to bring forward results that we believe are relevant to the broader INQUA membership, but also uh, to other uh, colleagues in institutions, in governments and across the world. Uh, I've put up a list of colleagues that uh, we're kind of going to cross the finish line with, if I may say that, but others have also been involved throughout the process. So thank you to everyone for their involvement again, and thank you uh, for, for everything that we have discussed and the interesting uh, conclusions that we have come to. What we present today is a collective view of everyone that you see listed here. So the objectives of the working group originally were to first map quality assurance approaches for micro-credentials across the European higher education area with a strong focus on the role of external quality assurance and quality assurance agencies. So this was our uh, direct focus. Also, to determine specific external quality assurance expectations for micro-credentials, to consider the applicability of the European standards and guidelines in quality assuring micro-credentials, and not least to develop guidance on key considerations of quality assurance for micro-credentials, which we're hoping can support both institutions and agencies in engaging with this very interesting topic. Now, importantly, uh, we need to say from the very beginning that we have looked at micro-credentials as an umbrella concept. And that means that it covers all instances of short, certified, portable learning, which forms part of an educational environment and hence may fall under external quality assurance arrangements now or in the future. We appreciate the fact that main characteristics of micro-credentials as they are described uh, currently, look at the fact that they are modular, stackable with flexible formats, support reskilling and upskilling and can be a direct contributor to lifelong learning. So we have tried to be as inclusive as possible and basically starting from the idea that whether you are calling this type of education micro-credentials or not, whether that's the terminology, uh, it still will cover, uh, our work will cover your particular uh, context. So we're looking at micro-credential type education in all its guises as we present our findings. And you need to uh, consider this particular aspect as you listen to what we have to say today. So why, why start this work? Um, and we've, 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 we did a survey and my colleague Esther will go into the detail of the survey, but similar to what we saw in the poll earlier uh, today, Basically, we have almost one third of agencies that are either currently quality assuring micro-credentials or are actively developing a method for quality assuring micro-credentials. And half of the agencies that responded to our uh, survey are looking to do something in the very near future. So clearly what we were hoping to achieve was to provide some support in these particular developments. Of course, this was backed up and is strongly backed up by other voices, authoritative voices that are telling us that quality assurance and what type of quality assurance is used to underpin micro-credentials is very important in the way micro-credentials can be recognized, can be stacked, can be made into uh, portable credentials overall. So this is, we believe, the reason why ENQA uh, supported this particular project 
and we're hoping that the findings will indeed provide the support that you require. Now, before we go on, uh, of course, important to say is that we are very much aware of the fact that short courses are in no way new. But what is new is the fact that funding streams are intensifying, labor market emphasis on lifelong learning is also uh, an area that we are looking with more prominence towards. Learner profiles and learner motivations are diversifying. Providers, all types of providers, not just higher education providers, are looking to engage with the educational environment. There is strong preoccupation for recognition, and this is where stackability and portability will come into play, and not least interest of governments and agencies to consider quality assurance. And you'll recognize that this is, as any quality assurance activity or initiative, looking to safeguard the student experience, looking to provide much needed public reassurances and aiming to enable comparability and consistency. The activities of the working group consisted in two surveys for mapping purposes, three online meetings that we held, one face-to-face -face meeting, and you can see the photographs there uh, in London, kindly hosted by the British Accreditation Council. And uh, we looked at exploring all of the European standards and guidelines, consulted extensive resources, organized obviously the current event, and are preparing the publication that uh, Patrick also introduced. So without further ado, I would like to thank you all for uh, participating today. I believe the number that we have is now set at 300, uh, which means that our topic is uh, something of interest. It can echo across the world and it gives value to the work that we have conducted across these uh, 18 months. Thank you all for participating. And thank you very much, Anka, for your presentation. Uh, and I think we are all looking very much forward to the publication of, uh, of the report of the work by the uh, Working Group on Micro-Credentials. But I think it's now time to, to focus on the mapping of quality assurance practices for micro-credentials uh, across the European higher education area, which is focused on the results of the ENCA survey. These are prepared by our colleagues Esther Huertas Hidalgo and Eduardo Garcia, I will be presented by Esther. Uh, Esther is, of course, member of the working group on micro-credentials and also head of the quality assurance department of uh, ACU Catalunya. So Esther, please show us the results of the survey. Thank you very much, Patrick, uh, for your kind introduction. And yes, now is the turn of uh, presenting the results of this ENCA survey, but before, I would like to start by thanking all the participants who has answered the questions in the survey because they, without their answers, we couldn't do this, this work. And it is also important to say, as uh, my previous speaker has already said, one of the aims of the working group was to know the state, the state of the art of this external quality assurance of micro-credentials. And that's what I'm going to, to try to explain right now to all of you. So, um, Okay, uh, yeah, the, this presentation is organized in five uh, principled elements. First of all, I'm going to explain very briefly um, a description of the survey and the sample we've got. Uh, I'm going to stop a little bit more on the statistics analysis that was uh, carried out with the principal components analysis for categorical data, the CAPCA method, and also uh, I will present the results and I will end with the challenges that were highlighted by the respondents of the, of the survey. So the survey was conducted during the month of April 2022. It included four uh, main sections. Section A and B were the more general ones. And the relevant sections were Section C, which included some questions on the agency's view on micro-credentials, while Section D was focused more on the opinion on 
uh, the relevance and applicability of the EEG among other elements. This slide shows the technical characteristics of the, of the survey. We've got uh, 64 valid respondents, but as, as you can see, we've got a slightly high sampling error. This could be explained due to the fact that we uh, take into consideration the total amount of members uh, of ENCA, and also because the sample itself it was a little bit small, and that also impacts in this uh, uh, sampling error. But on the other side, uh, you can see that the results coming from the re reliability and validity are very good. So we can conclude that the instrument was well built uh, and especially uh, in those questions related to the ESG. So as I have already said, we've got uh, 64 answers that belong to 43 different agencies, organizations. They are 60% of them um, have of a, a national status. Most of them um, uh, carried out evaluations at institutional and program level. And we can say that all of them work at or for a higher education system. So let's explain a little bit more these uh, statistics analysis that uh, was used. Uh, we used the, this CAPCA method. And here, what we try to do is to classify the different questions included in the survey into different dimensions, depending on the explanation capacity of the surveys, of the subjects, sorry. Um, so the questions and sub-questions belong to one or another dimension. The first dimension, dimension one, included those questions related to the vision, the questions related to the insight or the insight of the agency or the, depending on the experience of the agency. While dimension two include those questions linked to uh, how things are going to be planned, questions related to the how or questions related to how the agency do the things. So those slides uh, show how the questions are organized depending on dimension one or dimension two. I'm going to go very quickly through them as you're going to have all this information afterwards. But this is really uh, the, interest, uh, the interesting one. This slide shows the results after the application of the CAPTA method. As you can see, um, when we applied this uh, method, we obtained three um, three different groups. In other words, the agencies can be grouped in these three different groups. And right now I'm going to explain the main characteristics of them. So the group one, that it was um, composed by six uh, agencies, um, are the agencies that have answered not applicable or no to the most uh, generally to the questions, okay? And they also have the opinion that uh, the individual CSG are highly relevant or are highly applicable. And in this group of, um, of agencies, uh, we have also observed that they have adopted the definition of micro -ball project and fifth of them have adopted the definition of the European Commission definition. Okay, so the second group, is composed by nine agencies. And uh, this uh, group, we can say that are the most experienced ones. And why we can say this? Because there, there are different opinions when answering the questions. There are mo more diversity. So this means that the, the agencies have an internal or previous um, discussion on, the, on, on micro credentials. It is also important to say that there's a, re, re, a significant uh, percentage of disagreement when, um, when analyzing the applicability uh, of the, or the relevance of the ESG. And this uh, disagreement can vary from 10 to 50%. In this group, um, different agencies have adopted different definitions, microbial project definition, European Commission definition, or 
even though they, they can include their own definition. The third one is the, the group which included um, the highest number of organizations. And this group are, are the agencies which are in expectation, which are waiting for having more information coming from the national governments or new laws or statements from the European Commission, or they are waiting also, for example, the results of the working group. So as you can see here, um, there are, um, they have answered the questions generally with a not applicable, no, there are some, some yes in some questions. And also there's a slightly uh, disagreement in, in when analyzing the relevance of the ESG. So let's focus now on, on the results. Um, Anka has already presented the first graph uh, I would like to, to share with you. And the first idea, as, uh, as she has already said, and it is also totally aligned with the, with the pool um, we have uh, shared with you, is that uh, quality assurance of micro-credentials is just beginning. And we can see this because um, almost 40% uh, of the respondents um, they haven't begun to work with the qualifications of micro credentials, but they, they intend to do in the future. But there's an also a 20% of the respondents that they don't do it and they are not, they are not intending to do uh, almost at this, this moment, at least at this moment, sorry. And when we talk about when do you expect to start quality assurance of micro credentials, um, many agencies have not even yet discussed uh, the quality assurance of micro-credentials. Um, and those ones who have, uh, they expect to do uh, something in the next future, we can see that they have started the, the internal discussion. We also have a set of questions related to uh, how do you externally quality assure micro-credentials or how do you plan to do it in the, in the future? in relation to the cross-border uh, assessment, nationally or regionally assessment. And as you can see here, more than three quarters of the respondents didn't answer the question. So that's very significant. So in overall, the external quality assurance of micro-credentials, we could say that at this moment, it's not a priority for, for, the, risk moment, for the respondents. Uh, we also included uh, another set of questions in related on how to how do you do how do you externally quality assure micro credentials, and we included three options um, with a specific method, with the same or similar methodology you use for another program, or within the institutional methodologies. And as you can see, once again, three quarters of the respondents they don't know how to do it or they don't know how they are going to do in the next future. So we can see once again that the majority doesn't have a specific plan on how to externally assure the macro credentials. Um, there was another interest of the group in order to know if there was some uh, minimum quality threshold with a specific criteria or indicators. And once again, as you can see, 84% uh, of the respondents didn't answer the question. And the ones who have answered the question um, indicates that learning outcomes, um, um, staff qualification or ECTS are a minimum quality threshold criterion used by them. So there was the second group of, of questions, more focused on the relevance or applicability of ESG part one and part two. And in general, in overall, we can see that um, the respondents considered that ESG are very important in general. So here in this slide, you can see the results um, specifically for uh, ESG part one. 
and the most relevant ENG, ESG considered by, by the respondents were the policy for quality assurance, design and approval of program, student-centered learning, teaching and assessment. While at the bottom, we can find the cycl cyclical external quality assurance and public information. When moving to part two, um, we can see that the most relevant um, ESG are considerations for internal quality assurance, designing methodologies fit for purpose, and the criteria for outcomes. While at the bottom, we can find the complaints and appeals and reporting the standards. So later on, uh, my colleagues will go more deeply on the analysis of the ESG, but those are the results after analyzing the results of, um, of the survey. So finally, we, uh, we included also a question in relation with the, the challenges. Um, and it, it is very significant to see that globally, the challenges that were raised by, by the agency um, are more linked to external elements uh, of, the, of the quality assurance agency and mostly linked to develop national requirements, um, international agreements or clear definitions or understanding. And also there was a specific um, challenge and worry that was highlighted related to the burden of external um, assessment. So finally, I would like to thank uh, to all the members of this subgroup that were working very hard uh, when doing and preparing the survey and analyzing the results. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot to you, Esther, for this uh, revealing presentation. And I, I think the uh, results of the survey are more or less in line with the poll that we just did uh, before that there is still a lot to be discovered on quality assurance in micro-credentials. When the results of this survey um, uh, were, were public to the members of the working group, of course, it triggered the working group to do further analysis and make some reflections, uh, to set some expectations, and also to formulate some recommendations on the use of the ESG to externally quality assure uh, the micro-credentials. I would like to invite again Anka Greer, and uh, she's now joined by two other members of the working group, uh, which are Dagmar Proveen, Senior Policy Advisor, Flanders of the Accreditation Organization of the Netherlands and Flanders, NVAO, and also Ulf Hedbjörk, the Senior Analyst of uh, the Department of Quality Assurance of the Swedish Higher Education uh, Authority. Also, Georg Seppmann uh, from Evalak in Baden-Württemberg, uh, who is not joining uh, here uh, today, he contributed a lot to the next presentation. So, dear participants, if you have any questions for Anka, for Dagmar or for Ulf, please use the Q&A button to send uh, the question to us, because after this uh, presentation, there is also some time uh, for uh, the three colleagues to answer on some of your questions. Please, uh, Anka, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Patrick. Hello again to everyone. Um, so we're now moving closer to the actual findings to where we believe um, our recommendations can be, what we think might need to be the focus of future thinking, and specifically looking at the European standards and guidelines and their level of applicability. Uh, Esther very nicely showed us the, the graphs that go with it and the, uh, the views that colleagues had who responded to the survey in terms of uh, where exactly focus needs to be, if we need a different type of emphasis, if we need to look at some of the aspects maybe from a different perspective or with a different filter. And I think this is what we uh, were hoping to achieve and we, we hope that we have succeeded to try and look at the specificities of micro-credentials and try and see exactly where those specificities might fit across the European standards and guidelines and how we can give them attention in the future. So 
Um, basically, what we would like to do now is uh, to, to give an overview of what, how we have reached these findings and then move directly into uh, the actual recommendations that we have on the individual standards. So I'll start off by saying that we, when the working group was composed, in trying to delineate our mandate, we looked at a number of questions which seemed some quite practical, some uh, really in terms of strategic approach for looking at microprudential and investigating this reality. And our, let's say, more important area focused on external quality assurance, obviously because ENQA members are uh, agencies wanting to know exactly how they can take this reality forward and how they can provide those reassurances that are uh, so important. So uh, the questions that we, we started off with uh, and tried to come to some agreement on whether there should be external quality assurance of microcredentials overall as a generic question, or would there be reliance on internal quality assurance and that could serve as sufficient in different contexts and uh, national uh, legislations. Whether the ESGs were applicable and how peculiarities of their application might need to be dealt with. This was obviously the focus of what uh, our work constituted. The relationship to higher education and the question as to whether this is exclusively about higher education, is it about the articulation to higher education, collaboration with higher education, alternative providers coming into the educational environment with an offer for micro-credentials. So how far could we extend our attention? And of course, uh, ENQA is about higher education, but this doesn't mean that particular agency members of ENQA do not have a larger portfolio of providers and in that respect can bridge some of the gap between some of these elements of uh, educational importance. And at this point, we were wondering whether agencies would or could expand their portfolio in the future to go beyond higher education or to look at how higher education interacts more broadly with a phenomenon such as micro-credentials. And then, of course, the, the debate between if there is quality assurance, external quality assurance of micro-credentials, are we looking at an institutional level approach or would there be some sort of desirability for a program level uh, interaction? What would be the options and how those options may differ and may serve different purposes uh, within national contexts? And quite technically, let's say, because we keep hearing this in multiple events, the debate around if there is external quality assurance, is it ex ante, ex post? Should it be ongoing? How do we avoid the burden of what external quality assurance can bring to micro-credentials without affecting their agility, their flexibility, their adaptability, and without making uh, micro-credentials something that they are not meant to be without holding them back from their growth and potential development. Now, oopsie, sorry, here we go. Of course, in order to do this, we, we, we thought about the definition and we agreed very, very quickly that we weren't going to create a definition of our own because already authoritative voices were putting out definitions which had been thought of uh, in, in great detail. And I'm just illustrating here uh, some of the initiatives around defining micro-credentials. And Patrick talked about the microball uh, definition, which is uh, 
quite precise, let's say, uh, when we started our work, of course, the microball definition uh, was still a working definition. In the meantime, there are final results from the microball project. But the idea of having a new or another definition did not appeal to us as a working group. So uh, our publication will firmly state which is the definition that ENQA will go by uh, in uh, describing and discussing microcredentials. What we did also uh, look into were the characteristics of microcredentials, because these were going to provide the filter for our analysis of the European standards and guidelines. And of course, uh, what I've listed here are just a few of the, let's say, novel characteristics, what distinguishes uh, microcredential as a reality from traditional education possibly, or from the way we have gone about educational endeavors in the past. And again, uh, very important to note that uh, defining characteristics, uh, setting out characteristic is something that has been happening uh, quite frequently. So we had the benefit of making use of all of the resources available to allow us for this filter to go through. Uh, and some, some of the constitutive elements, again, illustrated here, uh, some frameworks more detailed than others, but all going towards the same direction of trying to identify the elements of differentiation. So the general findings, and some of these will seem quite commonsensical in a discussion about microcredential, but we believe they are important to be pinpointed uh, as as a, a general context setting for uh, any findings in relation to the European standards and guidelines. And the first thing to say is that reassurance for the quality of microcredential is extremely important. Now, how to gain those reassurances can, of course, be context dependent and will need to consider existing quality assurance arrangements. And we believe that the reason why some of the uh, agencies currently are maybe waiting to see where the discussions are going and where they need to intervene and where the development may, may, may need to be, uh, let's say, mostly focused is because uh, developing something around microcredentials is resource intensive um, and it needs to be beneficial to the whole educational environment. So capturing micro-credentials in external quality assurance processes, we believe, has benefits. How this is done, again, very much dependent on uh, context. Not least, we need to remember that if we are going to make proposals for external quality assurance processes, maybe additional investment needs to come in terms of tools for recognition models for stackability, and not least remembering the fact that many micro-credentials will be in online or blended format, and this brings with it an additional layer of complexity. Now, our overarching recommendations, and I'm just presenting a selection here, we believe they have validity for agencies, obviously, for providers, higher education providers, but also alternative providers, and not least governments trying to regulate this particular area, trying to collaborate on employability issues more broadly across their particular sector and societies. And of course, these recommendations should be read with what I would say or call quality goggles, uh, meaning that if these elements can be in place and can be supported, it is likely that the context will provide guarantees for quality of micro-credentials. So firstly, um, we would say that uh, the mission and vision of an institution, of a provider, of a national context looking at micro-credentials will need to be fully integrated with lifelong learning and need to accommodate a rationale for micro-credentials. We need to be able to articulate why this is so important to us and how it serves the context that we are operating in. 
clear responsibilities to be allocated for management and review of microcredentials also extremely important. The fact that policies would need to cover microcredential activities in a meaningful way. And again, here I insist on the fact that we do not want to take away from the agility of microcredentials and for the actual purpose that they are serving at this point uh, within an educational environment. Importantly, we believe that professional collaborations and academic partnerships need to be intensified for recognition and stackability purposes. Without these, it's unlikely that there can be full recognition and we can have effective functional stackability working in favor of micro-credentials. We also believe that labor market expertise needs to be even more prominent in quality assurance processes than it is currently. Um, and of course, uh, we are looking at the context of where micro-credentials are delivered and thinking that internal quality monitoring may need to be more frequent or may need to take different approaches. And for that reason, an existing quality assurance system may accommodate partially micro-credentials, but will need to make adjustments in order for micro-credentials to fully flourish. As such, ongoing agile adjustments need to maintain the currency, currency of content, currency of delivery, currency of technology that are related uh, to micro-credentials. And not least, and this is an important element, there have to be very clear closure triggers. These need to be explicit because as we know, micro-credentials may have a limited shelf life and we need to be able to move uh, with them uh, at speed. Now, this is very important, and I, I've highlighted this as a quote from the European Standards and Guidelines, because it really sets out the fact that the ESGs will be applicable in any form of uh, education. And this also means that programs that are not part uh, of a formal degree can be subject to the ESGs. As such, our question really was not if the ESGs will be applicable, but how they are applicable, where the focus needs to, needs to lie, where emphasis needs to be placed. And in what follows, I will invite my colleague Dagmar to first talk about part one of the ESGs and the specificities that we have identified and then invite uh, my colleague Ulf to present part two of the ESGs and again with the specificities highlighted. Please remember that what we are telling you today is a selection of uh, our findings. Full findings, of course, will be in the publication. So there may be things here that you're thinking we've missed off. Please put them in chat, but uh, they might already feature in our thinking. Uh, thank you very much. Dagmar, uh, over to you now. Thank you, Anka. And thank you all for being here today. So I will present the part one of the European Standards and Guidelines, and as you can see, it's about the internal quality assurance. My colleague Ulf will come next and talk about the external one. Of course, both are interlinked within the European Standards and Guidelines, guideline, so always remember that thing. Why are we here today? Why are you all so enthusiastic to be here today? Is because everybody is jumping on the bandwagon if we talk about the micro-credentials. And of course, they are important, and they are important both in view of people getting degrees or possibilities, new flexible ways to get a degree, but also for people who are involved in lifelong learning. It is good to remember that I see everything jumping around, so that, that's what they do just to make a joke of me, but that's no problem. Um, is now how to make it a qualitative jump. It's okay that everybody is jumping on the bandwagon and it is important, but again, how to do it qualitatively and not end up uh, under the wheels instead of on the bandwagon. What I will tell is not uh, the 10 commandments. So this is not uh, put in stone yet, 
but of course it are things that have to be taken into consideration when developing uh, the micro credentials and when quality assuring uh, the micro credentials the funny thing is that in fact what I'm saying could be very short, eh? as what we saw is that all standards apply. So that's easy. I could stop now and say, well, I'll do your homework and read the standards and guidelines, at least part one, and, and do what you have to do. Uh, of course, that would be a little bit of pity for the work we have done before. And as always in life, the devil is always in the details. So it's always good to, li to look a little bit closer to what is happening. And as we can see, and as people also said in the survey Esther was talking about, is that some of them may need some more attention or put some more food for thought and will need some more efforts from the uh, institutions offering the micro-credential or uh, designing them. Uh, but on the other hand, in fact, all are applicable. And so when working with it, most more things will pop up. So as said, this will not be the Ten Commandments. This will not be the end of the story today. So, but what is important and why are we doing this? And why is it so important to have this quality assurance on it and to think qualitatively and, and from the ESG, uh, from the perspective of the institutions is to promote transparency in Europe and to make that there's um, mutual trust among all those people delivering the micro credentials and making sure that from the student perspective they can use their micro credentials to build up bigger degrees or to get them relevant in other countries than where they have studied so as said this will be part one and as esther said number one two and three the policy for quality assurance design and approval of programs and student-centered learning teaching and assessment are very important or are considered very important for people thinking about quality assuring the micro credentials but as i said they're all relevant so what i will do is say well okay one and two are, is these are very important i will put a little bit more focus on them uh, especially of course, because one, in fact, has consequences for all that is beneath or already contains some of those elements. And then I will gather three, four, five, six, because the idea behind it is quite similar. And then seven and eight together, information management and public information, and nine and ten. And I will also focus on the cyclical external quality assurance, because I think, well, if you put this up and you talk about the ESG, then also this part is quite important. Just what focus should be uh, central is, of course, of, is a question that has to be answered. So 1.1 policy for quality assurance, of course, and it seems evident if you have these policies and if you have these processes to organize uh, the internal quality assurance of your institution, it is important that micro credentials will be explicitly considered in them because they have certain features. If we look at the Microbowl project, if we look at the publication from the European Commission, we see there's a lot of specific details that relate to the micro-credentials and to their quality. And so if you know why you have these micro-credentials in your institution or why in uh, this, this certain uh, offer of micro-credentials, that is one thing. So... And that's the extra element that comes with the policies for quality assurance, internal quality assurance, is to have a broader perspective and put the micro-credentials in a lifelong learning story. So to know why do I have these micro-credentials and how can I quality assure them and have an idea and have uh, strate strategic management, but also policies and processes uh, to realize what the ideas are. And of course, if you put attention on this, uh, you can also have some more specific elements that have to be taken into consideration. And that is, if we look at micro-credentials, why do we offer it? Well, it's in a lifelong learning perspective. So e-learning strategies may become quite important and need some extra focus uh, because, well, of course, the group of students that will enter the micro-credentials very often will be dependent on this e-learning alternative. So it relates to the e-learning strategy. But it's not only initial uh, programs, it's also for the lifelong learning. It is important that current research, current developments in a certain field are very well incorporated in the micro-credential offer of an institution. So both the policy on, on research and e-learning will also have 
quite some importance in the development of the micro credentials. Another fact that is because of this quite volatile group of students and this diverse, diverse group of students that can enter the building, uh, it is important to have a specific view on students and stakeholder feedback as well. First of all, students will be more volatile. On the other hand, stakeholder feedback, the stakeholders are way bigger group than what we have in other uh, or might be bigger than what we have in other programs, because it is important to have a strong relation to employers and to alternative uh, providers of the micro-credentials. Also industry, education and training centers can be important. And so research groups, it's, it's all in a sense bigger than what it was before, or it's more volatile than it was before. So a good view and a good grasp on how to get the stakeholder feedback to uh, improve and to enhance on the quality of the micro-credentials seems quite important in this respect. And then, of course, there's more. There's also, if we look at the Council recommendation on a European approach to micro-credentials and lifelong learning, there's a lot of concepts popping up that are quite important huh? and that have to be dealt with. Now, things are jumping around again. It's very funny. And it's, it's, it's like my computer is mind reading. But what we have is transparency is one thing. Transparency of what exactly is this micro-credential about and what can you do with it? Hmm? Is it a stackable one? Is it a non-stackable one? Is it just a free thing to have personal development? Or is it very central in certain uh, industries? And also the relevance. Eh? So how do you know that you keep up with new tendencies within fields, the relevance of it. Has it valid assessment? Because assessment, well, if you have a very diverse group of students that are not acquainted anymore with how uh, assessment is working nowadays, uh, it, it is very good that the information is there. But also the learning pathways, how do you, uh, is, is the micro-credential stackable? But also what's the validation, and this is a quite important, element within the micro-credential field, of course, is the validation of formal, non-formal and informal learning as well. How are previous degrees recognized? What's the portability? Eh? So is the uh, student owner of the degree? Can he just walk around in Europe and say, well, I have this degree and this is uh, what I want to do at your institution? So each of these aspects that already are uh, existing become more pregnant and more um, important when we look at the micro-credentials. So that's for number one. So how can we look at it is just to make sure that all of these concepts get a place and that the institution has a view on it, has an idea about what exactly they want to reach with the micro-credentials. Now let's turn to the second one the design and approval of programs. Also here, it seems quite important to get a little bit more attention on what exactly is happening and to have, in a sense, micro-credentials be part of the offer of the higher education institution so that you know micro-credentials in fact are in line with the wider offer of the higher education institution, but at the same time that they can keep their uh, and seen, be seen as a category of its own. So a micro-credential offer is something different. Huh? It has its peculiarities. But then again, if you look at the lifelong learning strategy, it is, of course, very nice to know that certain micro-credentials are those parts that do not fit in the regular programs. Because if you talk to people creating programs, well, they want to put all kinds of information and all kinds of modules in there. And in a sense, there's always a fight from who gets the most ECTS points for the things he wants to offer. If you look at from another perspective and a lifelong learning perspective, it could be that you say, well, this is the basic package that students need, and then we can look further and, and put it in the lifelong learning strategy for our institution. Again, strategic point from before, but it also uh, makes the possibilities for people creating, designing the programs uh, way wider and, and more interesting than it was before. So look at the advantages as well and just not see it as extra work for the people designing and offering the programs. So we will need separate structures to uh, 
uh, design them, but also, of course, budget allocated to create those specific programs that are in sense complementary to the offer that is already existing and that is a category of its own as well. What is important if we think about creating, and, and that's a point further, a lingua franca in which all people in Europe and even beyond possibly can understand each other when talking about what in fact is this micro-credential about, is to have a language that everybody can understand. And so it's very good to have, know what are exactly the objectives of uh, the micro-credential. If you look at the Holy Trinity of quality assurance, then we have, well, what in fact do you want to reach with your micro-credential? And then there's the point of how do you do it? And how do you show that you have accomplished what you wanted to? Uh, and can you show that students in fact know what they should know and be able to do what they should be able to do? So what we have is that if we could have this uh, common language when creating um, the micro-credentials, when building up the offer is to use the learning outcomes if possible, to use this, uh, the European credit transfer uh, system, and uh, acquisition system and so the ECTS and also to put the micro credentials somewhere in the European qualification or national qualification qualification frameworks you have so that everybody knows well okay when I want to build up a certain degree then I know which modules or which credits I have to take. Again, the involvement of all the relevant stakeholders is very important. As said, the group will be bigger. And it will be important to have this uh, due diligence procedures to get others, alternative providers, into the system. What we see now, at least in Flanders, as I see it, is that more people are asking to enter the higher education field to offer specialization programs. Well, these could very well be uh, created as micro-credentials in collaboration with higher education institutions and those new uh, providers that want to uh, enter the field. And what is important from the creation phase is that there is an explicit view on whether the micro-credential is stackable or not. Yeah? So not say, well, we here we have some offer of, of micro-credentials or the, these are things we already offered and let's see what we can do with it, but really build them and see how they are constructive uh, in view of lifelong learning, in view of previous programs, existing offer of programs, and how they relate to new research, to new expectations from society or new expectations from the professional field. Of course, there, there is nothing wrong with them being based on existing courses. That's also possible, but just be clear on it and look how it can help people to um, build up bigger degrees if possible. So just be clear on it from advance. And if you have these new ones, these brand new ones, then to pay attention to the stackability and make them uh, visible for people. As said, student-centered learning, teaching and assessment, student admission, progressive recognition and certification, the teaching style, learning to resources and student support, I will deal with it at, in one block because, well, what we have to take in mind when looking at this is, of course, and as already mentioned before and as will also be mentioned quite often, is the short or shorter life cycle of the micro-credential. If we want to get them uh, well in line with expectations from society, from research, etc., there will be some flexibility required and adaptiveness from the institutions. And so that's important for each of these standards. Because first of all, if you look at the group of students that uh, drop in, there may, may be very, very different learning styles, people who are acquainted with other institutions, with other uh, times in when you are studying. And so there's a diverse student population and that truly has to be taken into account if we want to talk about student-centered learning, because this means that, of course, things will need to be adapted within the courses and within um, the offer to get the micro-credential. 
Very important, and as already mentioned before, when you think about the policies you have to create, of course, is the admission and recognition. So if you want stackability, there needs to be some kind of fluency in the processes to recognize what people already know. And so formal, non-formal and informal learning become, and the recognition of it, become very important and will most probably need some new processes to make it a fluent system. And of course, as students may be linked for shorter times, how do you collect and monitor and act on information um, that is gathered when looking at the progression of the students? So how do students progress in this? There will be more probably a lot of dropout. There may be students who are there for quite different reasons. So someone to put it in stackable uh, degree, others not, others are just there for personal development. Uh, so the idea of whom is there and how can they interact with each other may be quite different. And also the staff may be multi-layered. As I said, if you need specialization, then the input from the professional field may be quite bigger, but then still needs to be acquainted with what research or whatever uh, is at a certain moment. So staff, will be multi-layered or will need to be multi-layered um, and the competence they have, are they professional, are they scholarly, or do we need something of both? And the student support services will also become more important. As you know, well, okay, given this diverse group again, uh, there will be flexible funding needed, so you can always act uh, flexible and adapt yourself to the situation as it uh, shows itself when having to deal with this uh, diverse group of students. And as said, if you want people from the professional field involved in a certain um, micro-credential, it will be important to have flexible recruitment and professionalization means for teaching and certainly administrative and supportive staff. So flexibility more than we may expect from fixed programs as we know them now. In line with it, the information management and the public information, well, okay, again, and, and I have to repeat it, of course, but maybe that's an important thing, is this sh short cycle of the micro-credential again. So the system of data collection will need to be adapted to it. If students can easily disappear or after a short time, then how do you get them involved in the evolution of the program? Because you can think that, for example, alumni of a program are quite important for micro-credentials, but even in, in normal programs, it's rather difficult to get a good alumni working. Patrick is showing that I have to round up. Oh, it was a bit too exciting, but that was because the slides were moving all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I always have a reason, that's for sure. So the public information provision is also important. Students need to know, what do I start with? What's the thing I'm getting involved in? And so it is important, and now I just mentioned this one, it could also be microball, but to have information provision for the students that is in line with European standard elements to describe micro-credentials and the European principles for the design issuance of micro-credentials. And then the last one, which is also important, and uh, I will just say, okay, shortly ongoing monitoring and periodic review of programming. Again, short cycle, sorry, <laughs> but it is a reality. They are short, so what you need is Agile systems to start up micro-credentials and agile system to see what is relevant, what micro-credentials do we need, and also fast ways to close them if they are not relevant anymore, if they do not fit the other programs anymore, if they do not fit the needs of the people or uh, the society or industry, there should be smooth ways to close it all down. But what you need is just a small and, and a smart system of indicators that capture these evolutions in the field. That's important as well. And of course, as always, to make sure that you can evolve as much as possible of the, and that's important, micro-credential relevant stakeholders, not the usual groups, but also the extended set of whom could be relevant. And concerning the cyclical external quality assurance, well, we could say, is this needed? Is this required? Well, most probably it is. Huh? Uh, and then again, take the life cycle into account, and so aim at the right organizational level to avoid administrative burden. Is external quality assurance of singular 
micro credentials possible well this could be quite a hard system to do if we do it at the institutional level and make the institutions responsible themselves this could be another answer but that i'm going to leave to my colleague ulf uh, who has had to wait long enough to get the floor so ulf have your my colleague from sweden the floor is all yours Thank you very much, Dagmar. Uh, I'll just see if I... Yeah, so thank you very much, Dagmar. Uh, I, I can feel the, uh, two, our 295 guests longing for coffee break, so I, I promise you uh, we will be in time for the coffee break. Um, so uh, the European standards and guidelines, as you know, are, are, are of a complementary character. So all the three parts really of the European standards and guidelines uh, are, are closely interlinked. So uh, what I will be showing uh, of, of uh, the relevance of micro-credentials to uh, the EST part two will be in many ways something now that you will have heard or recognized from from uh, the findings that we've seen in the, of the survey earlier uh, presented by Esther, but also uh, the findings and reflections presented by Anka and Dagmar. So um, let me give you a few general remarks to start start off with. I mean, uh, and the first one has to do with with the applicability of the ESG. Well, this is not the first time uh, that the ESG are somehow challenged or or asked to, to deal with something that is not uh, the, the mainstream bulk of, of our education. Uh, and I give you, gave you a few examples here. For instance, quality assurance of joint programs, um, where there is the European approach for quality assurance, uh, entirely based and, and, and funded and grounded in the European standard and guidelines. Uh, also for cross-border assessment, cross-border quality assurance, uh, the ESG are highly relevant and, and uh, have proved to, to be applicable. Uh, I think uh, in the, the registered European Quality Assurance Register uh, mentioned that about half the, the registered agencies in the ECHA in the register have some experience or regular uh, experience of cross-border uh, quality assurance, which is also then grounded uh, on uh, on the ESG. Also for e-learning, the e-learning provision, uh, ENCA uh, produced a few years ago uh, uh, an occasional paper on the considerations of quality assurance for e-learning programs. Uh, and this, of course, as somebody mentioned, the commentaries about MOOCs, e-learning MOOCs, micro-credentials, they are all somehow part of the digitalization wave, uh, uh, but in their own particular way. The second thing uh, is about uh, how the, lo the look at the micro-credentials and, uh, and their quality assurance, uh, external quality assurance, it really opens up new aspects for quality assurance agencies as for uh, institutions. And uh, it is clearer than ever that uh, with the micro-credentials, higher education is really explicitly geared towards lifelong learning. And this has already been mentioned before. Now, different national contexts uh, have different uh, histories and history and uh, different uh, legislation uh, accommodating this but it is a clear um, characteristics of micro credentials uh, the lifelong learning perspective so i agree with my colleagues before that all the standards also of esg part 2 are applicable and this is not really a question if but how and there are still some challenges that we are going to look into um, these are the standards, they are the seven standards you will recognize, and uh, I will talk uh, a little more about the four, first four standards. Uh, we remember maybe from Esther's presentation that also criteria for outcomes were regarded as very uh, important, but uh, they, uh, the standard as it is written uh, uh, should be applicable without uh, uh, very many uh, adaptions. So I will focus on the four, the first four standards. And uh, first, which is of course consideration of internal quality assurance at the higher education institution. So this is really what Dagmar has showed us very well that everything that is 
uh, in the, the in the first ten standards is applicable and should be taken into consideration by external quality assurance because the link between internal and external external quality assurance should always be clear. So I, let me just say that the micro credentials as a phenomenon uh, testify to the increased complexity of higher education and also the growing diversity and not the least uh, growing expectations on higher education institutions to play a much more uh, active role in uh, in uh, professional life and, and labor market demands uh, individual individuals uh, needs for re upskilling reskilling and so on so uh, increased complexity also the strong link to working life which is uh, obviously uh, linked to the lifelong learning perspective that we have already mentioned also the modular view on higher education uh, and uh, it, it is clear that uh, depending on the national context uh, the modular modular view might present a uh, bigger or smaller challenge in some systems the modular view is already uh, in rooted in the system uh, which could make it easier to 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 also manage the micro credential phenomenon whereas in other systems this is really about breaking up uh, maybe a more monolithic uh, uh, view of, of higher education so it could be uh, could present different challenges so our conclusion is that this invites a holistic approach to external quality assurance because the complexity demands it um, the second standard, the designing uh, methodologies fit for purpose. Well, the big question for us and, and for uh, our respondents of, of, in, of the survey is, of course, if you put yourself as an agency in the perspective of institutional reviews or institutional audits, rather than program evaluations or, or program uh, programmatic perspective. And we do find that uh, the assessment procedures the, the focus on, on the institution or the institution's quality, internal quality assurance processes appear to be more applicable than procedures targeted to single micro-credentials because of the complexity, because of the multitude that opens up uh, if we, we should start um, quality assurance or external quality assurance of singular uh, micro-credentials. So if, depending on the system, uh, or a national context, we still need to do some kind of external quality assurance of short learning units, such as the micro credentials. This is a real challenge because of the, the danger of, of increasing the workload and the cost for, for higher education institutions, as well as for quality assurance agencies. Second, lifelong learning perspective needs to be taken into account. And this is, of course, according to what the offer uh, on, and the remit of, uh, of higher education institutions is in a spe specific national context. Uh, and just as important that in the design of methodologies, uh, labor market stakeholders should be closely involved. Uh, this might seem uh, as self-evident, but uh, it is for many, I would say for many uh, agencies, uh, uh, a new way or, or, or uh, a way to reinforce this, uh, the, the presence of labor market stakeholders. And it could be a challenge also to work with labor market stakeholders. I know there are some questions in the, in the question and answers that touches upon the non higher education providers, for instance, what to do with them and what to do with the, the relationship between higher education, traditional higher education and non higher education provision of micro credentials. Um, third standard uh, about the implementing processes, well, it, which usually consists of the self-assessment of the higher education institution, an external assessment if on a site visit, but also, of course, of reporting, uh, usually with recommendations, and, and the follow-up processes. Uh, we would like to draw particular attention to the self-assessment and the external assessment uh, when it comes to micro-credentials, because for the self-assessment, it would be important for external quality assurance to to really understand and see uh, what uh, the universities uh, do and what their offer is and how they what the functions and roles of micro credentials are in their offerings uh, what the profiles and experience of staff teaching staff is and also how the micro credentials are, are described and how they differ 
uh, from from uh, other provision uh, the stackability the standalone versus stackability and if the progression if progression is important or if progression is sort of left out of the picture so all these things need to be specifically referenced in the self-assessment and when it comes to the external uh, assessment on the site visit uh, it is important to include external perspectives it could go as far as including interviews with uh, non higher education providers or external providers, of course, if this is deemed um, uh, adequate and relevant. The last standard uh, to look at in uh, the ESG part two uh, are the peer review experts. And this is really, this is uh, really uh, the standard that most agencies responded to in the survey uh, was very important and emphasized the importance to look at at the competences and the training of the peer review experts because this could really um, uh, this could really be a challenge and, and a, a new thing to the experts and to the agency to 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 find find uh, the right experts so the need for experts familiar with the special features of mcs uh, and also so in the experience in curriculum design of, sh or of short programs also experience in teaching if possible, in smaller lectures, lecture units, and the competence or competency-oriented learning and teaching experience, which could be uh, a need for, to look for other kind of experts than in mainstream higher education quality assurance. Um, if applicable, there might be a need to, to assure knowledge related to the discipline or labor market domain that is being under uh, review. Student representatives should also have some experience in short courses and uh, micro-credentials, if possible. Uh, the tools that are usually there for uh, that quality assurance agencies provide for their experts uh, include guidelines. So the guidelines should be uh, reviewed uh, to see if they need to be uh, annotated somehow or adapted to micro-credential situation. And also the preparation and training for, for uh, the experts might need to be um, viewed in a micro-credential specific perspective. So finally, a few conclusions. Uh, uh, the conclusion is really that a robust internal quality policy and processes are crucial. So this is the internal quality assurance policy and processes of the higher education institutions. And I mentioned that uh, a, a more institutional review institutional audit perspective is really highly recommended as it uh, seems from our, our findings whereas uh, the program level evaluation is not encouraged because it would be, become much too complex and also that the processes and procedures that are in place for programs for full programs are not uh, maybe uh, relevant and adequate the lifelong learning becomes more important as we already mentioned and it should be a topic in quality assurance. It might be interesting to know that in the present uh, European standard and guidelines, uh, the concept of lifelong learning is not mentioned. So this is really something that challenges also uh, not, not the, the applicability of the standards and guidelines, but the view on what higher education is and, and uh, what it means to quality assure the whole offer of higher education institutions. Um, then uh, micro-credentials might develop the role of our agencies uh, towards an even more supportive role beyond the assessment of compliance. So it, it could, for instance, mean, and there are already a few, uh, a number of agencies that have in their remit not only quality assurance of traditional higher education, but also in uh, uh, continuous professional development or adult education or, or upper uh, vocational edu higher vocational education, vocational education. So this might be, uh, the micro credentials might also be something that the quality assurance agencies could um, help or support uh, higher education institutions to to develop and uh, and especially the quality culture, including micro credentials, be they pro produced in house or somehow by non higher education providers. And the last one I would like to point out is that uh, cross border quality assurance and transnational quality assurance could very well be promoted by uh, the, the advent of micro-credentials 
for instance, in the European University Initiative Alliances, micro-credentials might well be uh, packages that are uh, very lim well limited and uh, part of, of the offer that will come out of the alliances so far. Um, and before I go too much into the future, I will hand over again to Anka to see what the future holds for us. Please, the floor is yours, Anka. Thank you very much, uh, Ulf, and thank you, Dagmar. I think very comprehensive details. I'm hoping that uh, colleagues on, on this particular uh, call are and have been uh, kind of, I don't know, taking notes or taking note of, of the things that we have been saying, and hopefully this will be useful for them in preparing for the future. And just very quickly to say that obviously we have not been able to look at all the dimensions or all the implications of micro-credentials. As we saw from the poll, many of you, many of us are still considering how to engage with micro-credentials, thinking about them for the future. And I think uh, uh, pa Patrick said this is not the end, but it's possibly just the beginning of our considerations and our reflections. So what we want to leave you with are uh, some elements that might actually make for a more, let's say, functional future in terms of micro-credentials. Um, so we would say that there definitely has to be more thinking on the integration of lifelong learning. This is extremely important. Ulf uh, mentioned the challenges to the ESGs in relation to lifelong learning, and this definitely is very, very uh, pertinent at this point. More effort definitely needs to be put towards models for recognition and stackability if this is going to be something that can work and bring the benefits that we expect more consideration of the dynamics between various types of providers and the interactions. And we believe that this shouldn't be the challenge, but should be the encouragement for higher education institutions to enter collaborations and enter partnerships. And maybe last, but definitely not least for our quality assurance agencies, uh, we might want to consider more visionary approaches for the future in how we support education developing and moving forward. So in principle, what we're saying is that the future will hold more and more and more. Uh, and we would like you to uh, help us contribute to that future as we move uh, with this discussion forward. Thank you very much to all. Patrick, back to you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Anka. Thank you very much, dear colleagues, for elaborating on the apl applicability uh, of the ESG to quality assure micro-credentials. So uh, we've seen that there are very lively discussions in the chat and our colleagues uh, have also put some questions in the Q&A. Uh, we will not be able to answer all the questions live because I think in a couple of minutes it's time for a break. But those questions we cannot address right here, right now, we will be able to address them in written form or uh, oral form during the second part of this webinar. So um, Anka, Ulf and um, Dagmar, may I ask you to also join here? Uh, I have a couple of questions for you and let's, let's start with a, a very simple or maybe not that simple question, which is how to differentiate real micro-credentials versus false uh, micro-credentials. Should I start and then, and then see where it goes? Uh, yes, definitely. I don't think I would put the label of simple on this particular question. Uh, but what I would say is that this links very much to the requirement of having very clear certification information so that uh, the information that goes with the micro-credential in terms of all of the elements and the characteristics that we have been describing is there, is transparent, is made available any prerequisites are, are there to support the learner in making the decision about whether this is the right micro-credential or not. And definitely recognition and stackability models will help towards validating particular micro-credentials as we move with these arrangements. Okay, thank you, Dagmar or Ulf, do you want to contribute to this, Dagmar? Yeah. Well, yeah. maybe one thing, it, it is important that, of course, all institutions and also higher education institutions we know in the system provide this information very well and, and 
think about what the micro credential means in terms of lifelong learning or what the exact aim of it is. So it is clear and also the information provided so students exactly know what they want to do. And the more transparent the system uh, in the whole of Europe becomes, if we have an agreement on this information, if we have an agreement on the recognition, etc., it becomes way easier to distinguish what is in the field and it will be recognized. And so the other ones will be, of course, of another value than the ones entering the system as it is. I might add also that, that of course, at the root of of uh, quality assurance in Europe is that higher education institutions have full responsibility for uh, what, uh, the, what they provide. Uh, so the, the question could be uh, if you deliver something uh, as, a, a, as a university, you know that, and, and if you choose to, to deliver it in a, in, a, in a stackable way, a part of a program, a, a traditional way, or if you do it in a more uh, standalone way, uh, this is part of many institutions work already, provision already. There may be new thing, and somebody brought up MOOCs uh, as an example in, in the discussion, uh, I think is that you are still, as a higher education institution, responsible for the quality of uh, what you deliver, even though uh, you may not be as, as um, much in command of of uh, how the design of these micro credentials, and there, there is there is a, a challenge and and also an opportunity, as Anka mentioned, of collaboration and how various models for maybe common clearinghouse models or or, or whatever could come out of the future uh, and how to deal with this, because we all know that to have recognition procedures for ev each and every. Um, short learning experience is not a, a possible way from uh, forward. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, dear colleagues. Um, another question. Uh, I found it also a, a very interesting, somehow provoking question in the Q and A section. Is um, the fact that micro credentials are sometimes about gaining focus or practical professional skills? Um, does this challenge higher education to collaborate? Um, or use external professional associations as part of this quality assurance. Can I jump in again? Because I, I did oh, venture okay. an, a very short answer in the Q&A. And I think uh, what, what we are all suggesting through our findings is that definitely the <clears throat> intensification with professional associations, the labor market on the whole, needs to happen at all levels both within the higher education institutions and from the perspective of the quality agencies. So in a way, we would be hopeful that actually viewing that as a challenge um, might not necessarily be the case, but maybe we could look at it as an opportunity, as an encouragement for what the future might hold. And it might mean for some higher education institutions that there has to be a shift in approach, strategic approach potentially, even in mentalities and ways of interacting with their stakeholders. But we definitely have to move with the times and possibly uh, institutions that will not make this leap or not make this connection will be losing out uh, longer term. Yeah, a question that is somehow related, uh, not fully, but somehow, um, was about the alternative providers um, and um, the, the collaboration between those uh, accredited, those higher education institutions that we all know, that we're all very familiar with, and the from many of us, still unknown alternative providers. Can you elaborate uh, on this a bit, please? Dagmar Ulf, would you like to come in or should I start it off? I can come in if you want. Okay. Uh, I think the alternative providers, as, as Anka already said, it's an existing phenomenon. It has to be in intensified. And of course, it will have to be clear what groups you really want to get involved in the programs. But what you see is that the demand is not only from higher education to the professional field, but also vice versa. So if you already have this group interested and knowing what qualifications they need in the professional field, it could be that the communication just has to be streamlined. And so that demand that already exists just becomes clearer for the institutions themselves. So it is something existing, it just has to be intensified and, and the trust systems for trust, so the due diligence procedures 
uh, maybe need some more attention so that institutions know what providers can easily be incorporated in the system they already have. And if I may add, I think due diligence will be strongly helped by any external quality assurance procedures that can give the reassurances that alternative providers coming into collaboration with higher education institutions can actually guarantee the quality of their uh, of their provision to allow for the recognition and in in time for the stackable options for those micro credentials so this is where i see the role of external quality assurance and i think we would agree on the working group that this is where uh, external agencies need to come in quite strongly okay thank you thank you very much uh, I have the feeling that also on this topic on, of alternative providers, we can dedicate one or two uh, or even more webinars because, again, this is uh, an ongoing discussion as we are telling about uh, mainly everything on uh, micro-credentials. But um, I, I think now it's time for a short break. So I want to thank you, Anka, Dagmar and Ulf for your uh, contribution. Um, and in a moment, we will take a look at a selection of case studies focusing on internal quality assurance of micro-credentials. Uh, but I see on my watch that we've been talking for more than half, one hour and a half. So it's now time to, to grab a coffee, to have a sandwich, or just relax uh, a bit. And we see each other again in about 15 minutes. So thank you already for joining us and see you back in 15 minutes.